Good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. I'd like to welcome Daniel Johnson, who has joined us for this meeting this morning. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silent mode so that they don't affect the committee's work this morning? Item one, decision on taking business in private. Can I have agreement to take item three in private, please? Agreed. Thank you. Item two is the 2016-17 audit of the Scottish <laughs> Police Authority. We will now take evidence on the Auditor General's 2016-17 audit of the SPA. And I welcome Andrew Flanagan, former chair of the Scottish Police Authority, John Foley, former SPA chief executive, David Hume and Dr Nicola Marchant, both current board members of the Scottish Police Authority. Now, the purpose of today's meeting is to take oral evidence on the Auditor General's 1617 audit of the SPA. Some members may also wish to ask questions about other governance issues that have emerged since the audit was published. I will make clear that the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner, or PERC, is carrying out ongoing investigations into senior police officers under a statutory process. Committee members and witnesses should not say anything that could potentially compromise these investigations. I'm now going to open for questions. I'm going to start with the first question myself. Um, Mr Flanagan, there has been much uh, publicity, things said in public, and indeed uh, a statement from the Cabinet Secretary in the Chamber regarding your meeting with him in early November. Can you please give us your account of those events? Well, it, uh, it surrounded the situation at the end of uh, October, beginning of November. Uh, the Chief Constable's uh, leave was under consideration. The, uh, the leave had been uh, had been agreed uh, late August, early September, uh, but it was subject to a four weekly review that was coming up at the early part of November. Um, the chief constable had indicated in a number of ways that uh, he was fit and able to return to work. He had requested permission to do some work for the uh, National Police Chief Council. Um, and uh, also some of the other things that had been agreed at the time of his leave seemed to be no longer the case, uh, the stress, the health issues that he was under, and also in terms of the, um, uh, the distraction created by the, uh, the uh, uh, complaints themselves. Those things seemed to have abated, and so the, uh, the board of the SPA had to take a view as to whether or not the terms of those uh, leave conditions had now been satisfied and whether or not he should return uh, to work. Um, that was the discussion that we had. We concluded that uh, he, uh, the temporary leave con conditions had been fulfilled and that he was therefore to be considered for a return to work. Um, We'd also have to, in that situation, consider whether or not suspension would have been appropriate, uh, because that would have been uh, an issue that we would have to have faced when he did return to work. Uh, and we talked through those decisions uh, and however we come. There's actually only three options open to the SPA in those situations. One is that the individual can remain in post. Uh, one is that they can have restricted duties, or the other is suspension. And I should stress that suspension is not any indication or implication of uh, wrongdoing or guilt. Um, and in terms of suspension, there are only two considerations open to uh, the SPA. One is whether or not there is any risk of interference with the investigation or whether it's in the public interest to suspend. Um, so we, we discussed those issues uh, and we came to the conclusion that uh, uh, suspension wouldn't be applicable at that time and therefore uh, we took this, the decision that we should invite the Chief Constable to uh, return to work. I should stress that uh, the, the leave of absence was at the request of the Chief Constable. It wasn't the SPA who put this in place. And the terms of the agreement with the Chief Constable was that he himself could elect to return to work. It wasn't just a decision for uh, the SPA. Um, I decided that uh, having 
reach that conclusion that I wanted to advise the Cabinet Secretary of that. Um, and uh, I met with him, uh, uh, I can't remember the exact date, but it was in early November. Um, and uh, he, um, I explained the circumstances, um, and um, he told me that it, he thought it was a bad decision. Um, it was clear to me that he did not want the Chief Constable to return at that point. Um, we had a discussion about stability of the senior team, uh, because that was a consideration that the SBA had had. Uh, but I had to uh, attend the Justice Subcommittee, uh, so there was a very short period of time, and uh, I uh, didn't extend the conversation. I had to go to the committee. Um, and when I came out of committee, um, uh, I was asked to go back to see the Cabinet Secretary. At this point, there were three officials present, um, and uh, it was clear that the Cabinet Secretary was still very unhappy, but he changed to... Uh, discuss the process rather than the decision itself. I reminded him of, of his comment earlier that uh, it had been a bad decision. Uh, he told me not to bother with that, um, and um, we then went on to discuss some of the process itself. There were two particular points uh, raised. Um, one was uh, Perk's position on uh, interference. Uh, we had made our own assessment of that position, uh, but the Cabinet Secretary wanted it to be a, a more formal, uh, written uh, uh, response from, from PERC. And we also discussed the well-being uh, plan uh, for those affected directly by the Chief Constable's uh, return. Um, he said that the process was deficient with, without these. I thought that deficient was an, an odd word because it sounded as if something was missing rather than something being wrong. Um, it's also the case that uh, on interference, that's only an issue for suspension. It's not an issue uh, connected to uh, the leave conditions. Um, and we could have got Perk's con position on that. Uh, there wasn't any particular reason that we would have expected it to be anything different. And I, indeed, I believe that Perk has already come back and said that they had no thoughts that there would be interference at that time. So that, that took that word, was out, out of the way. On well-being, we had already discussed it as a board and how we would uh, approach that. Uh, we thought that it would be important that, in terms of pro progressing with it, uh, that we would need to involve uh, both the senior team at Police Scotland, uh, the individuals who had made complaints, and indeed the Chief Constable himself, to come up with a robust plan as was requested. We couldn't really start those uh, discussions until the Cabinet Secretary had been informed. Uh, but it was always our intention that that would have been put in place. And in fact, uh, if the Chief Constable had not taken uh, leave at the end of uh, August, early September, then we would have had to put such a plan in place at that point in any event. Um, so it, for me, it was not something that should have taken a great deal of time to, uh, to deal with the issues uh, that um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary had raised and therefore I left the meeting and uh, put the Chief Constable's return on hold. Mr Flanagan, at what point did you change your mind? Well, I thought it best that if the um, Cabinet Secretary was unhappy, uh, that it would be better for all parties to try to resolve that uh, before the Chief Constable actually uh, returned. Uh, so, uh, based on the meeting, that's when I changed my mind. Based on both meetings, you said there was two that day? Yes. Okay. I mean, you you said you made the decision on the basis the Cabinet Secretary w was unhappy. Um, you said that in the first meeting that day, he made clear, I think he used the words, that it was a bad decision. Did you feel you were being directed to change your decision? Uh, not, not at that point, no, I didn't, didn't think that that was it. I, th I, th I thought there was a point of disagreement, uh, but when I went back for the second meeting, it was a discussion about process rather than about the decision itself. And as I say, he deflected the point on uh, whether he still thought it was a bad decision. Mm -hmm. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um I'd like to look a little bit about the 7th of November board meeting. Now, it was a pr meeting taken in private, and presumably there's no minutes. Are there minutes for this meeting? There, there, would, there would be minutes, yes. Well, I, I, sorry, Mr. B, I certainly would have taken a note at, at the meeting, but I would have left the police authority before the thing 
may have been typed up, so I can't answer. So who has these notes? I would have them in a notebook in my office, or what was my office. Would that have been passed on to anybody to create a minute? I would, I would normally have created a minute from it. Um, so you create, did create a minute from it? Uh, uh, no, I didn't. I don't think I did from that, actually. When I so think you about didn't? It now. So but there was a note, yeah. There was, so there was minutes of the meeting that took place up until that discussion, and then I took a separate note because the minute taker was asked to leave because it was a confidential matter uh, relating to the Chief Constable. So, given that you, you, were, pre you were still active in SPA until the end of November? Yes. During the time between the 7th of November and the end of November, you didn't create a minute from your notes? Not that I recall. I was on leave for a, a part of that as well. Um, but I would have to I would have to ask someone in SPA mm -hmm. to confirm that. And it wasn't passed on to anyone else to create a minute? I would, again, I would have to ask uh, someone in SPA to confirm that. So there that. is no record of that decision? There could be a record of the decision, possibly. There could be, but yeah. we don't know where it is. No. Yeah. Um, just just to, to carry on on that, there was an agenda for this meeting. Was there? There was an agenda for the board meeting, yes. Uh, the, Did it include the, discussion about the Chief Constable? The, the discussion about the Chief Constable, <clears throat> my recollection was it was taken under any other business. Okay. So it wasn't on the agenda, so no one would actually know that it was coming up <coughs> at that point? No. Not other than the members, <clears throat> yeah. So the board members would know? How? Well, it would have been... Um, the situation was that the chief constable's leave was reviewed uh, broadly every four weeks, you know, but there was a timeline where things had to be reviewed. So the members would have known, because they would have discussed it four weeks prior to that approximately, that they then had to come back and discuss it again. So they would have to remember that it was coming up to another discussion on that? Well, no, because the, the members are in and out. <coughs> of, I keep using the wrong tense. I haven't quite got used to not being there yet. But the members were in and out of the office on a regular basis. So there was dialogue going on between members in relation to... Uh, various subject matters, and that had always been the case. So the members would have been aware that there was a requirement to discuss this. The chair would have been uh, in frequent contact with the members uh, in relation to some of these matters as well. Given that uh, this is such an important item, was there a full full attendance of board members? I think there, I think there was. I can't remember any uh, any absentees on the on the day. Thank you, convener. Uh, just apologies for butting in, um, but I just wanted, as current board members, to support um, what uh, Mr. Foley is saying. Is that subsequent to his, we do have a, um, a, a minute from the 7th of November that was produced based upon Mr. Foley's notes and was circulated to board members. So it does exist. Um, our records show that it was brought up under any other business. We, as board members, were aware that this discussion was going to be taking place as we'd had a previous discussion, uh, which is also minuted as part of the closed board meeting on the 31st of October, at which case we were considering it, but we had requested further information, which was brought to us on the 7th of November. Give me a, perhaps it might be interesting to see a copy of this minute. Is that something you can provide to us, Dr. <coughs> Marchant? I would just have to go back um, to the Scottish Police Authority to confirm that because it is a restricted closed because of the nature of the discussion. And I just want, so I'll go back and, and um, if we can, we'll supply that. Okay, we'll certainly explore that with the SPA following this meeting. Colin Beattie. Coming, coming back to, to this question of who attended the meeting, was it a full board meeting? In other words, were all the board members there? My, they, they would certainly all have been invited. Um, I can, um, my records, um, and they're still draft, um, confirm that there were two apologies. The rest of the board were there. Okay, so, so reference in the documentation here that there was a unanimous board decision. Is that correct, given that two members weren't present? It was unanimous of the members who were there. That would be a normal position to take. Uh, th I would probably have had discussions with the other members who were absent to inform them of what had taken place at the board meeting. And if any objections had been raised, I would have taken those back to board. 
Outside of the board members, did anyone else have any knowledge that there was going to be discussion on the Chief Constable's future? Um, no, Would I'm any not. other stakeholders have been consulted prior to? They would, have, they would have been aware that uh, the, I, I believe the Chief Constable's uh, review period was the 4th of November, and we had not extended it at that point. So although I don't recall if we actually told anybody, uh, it would have been uh, evident to those who were close to the situation that it must be a topic of discussion. There seems to be a lot of assumptions that uh, people somehow keep a record of the possibility that this might come up. It, it doesn't seem particularly uh, strong in the <clears> way it's been handled. I think it was reported in the press, actually, that we uh, had still to decide on it. Uh, so, it, it, you know, people do take note of these so things. So people, people were expected to look at the press reports and hope that they can pick it up from there. It really... It really doesn't seem a very robust system that you've got here. Now, on the 8th, you then decided to that the Chief Constable would return to his duties. You advised. There was discussion on press releases and so on about it. And there was a curious phrase involved in that, which said... Mr. Gormley is now confirmed to the chair of the SPA, Andrew Flanagan, that he has had sufficient time to prepare himself for the conduct allegations made against him at this time. Was that the criteria on which you decided that he should return to duty? It, it was one of the conditions that was discussed at the time he asked for temporary leave, uh, that uh, he, had, he considered himself to be significantly distracted by uh, the intensity of the press activity, plus dealing with the issues that had given rise to the complaint <coughs> in the first place, uh, he had to uh, go through a process of documenting his own response to those complaints. Uh, and what he'd can said at... Flanagan, can I just remind members and witnesses mm. that we must not mm. stray into the detail of the, any of the complaints that Perk mm. is investigating? Indeed. and. Members and witnesses should be careful about their questions and responses. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that, convenient. Uh, I think that uh, it, because it had been one of the things <coughs> that he had cited as a reason for the, the leave, we had responded back in terms of the press release when... Was consideration was given by the board to the situation as far as the complainants were concerned? Yes, we had discussed the well-being uh, arrangements and how that would do. <coughs> it's, it's worth noting that uh, most of the complainants, uh, well, all of the complainants did not report to the chief constable. Only one of them was physically located in Tully Allen, where the chief constable is based. Everybody else was in different locations. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not unusual in a situation where there's complaints that you have to create a well-being plan to uh, cater for both the, those who have made complaints and those who have been complained against. You took the decision to go public with this or to, <coughs> to, to, to go to Mr Gormley with this. Did you consider it would have been wise to have discussed it with other stakeholders as well, Scottish Government or other people that have an interest in this? Because it is a matter of great public concern. I, I, I think that the first step was uh, to have a discussion with the Chief Constable to see if there were any other issues that would prevent his return. Uh, I had that conversation and we had his agreement that he was prepared to return. Uh, and then the next step was to talk to the, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary about it. At what point did you determine that you would advise senior police officers of the decision? I decided that we would do that as soon as we had spoken to the Cabinet Secretary. Now, as late as the 9th, you are preparing press releases and so forth. At that point, the day before he was returning to duty, had you actually contacted any of the senior police officers? Because clearly there would have to be arrangements made and, uh, you know, consideration as to comp how to protect complainants, all this sort of thing. So it wasn't something that would be an overnight job. As soon, as soon as it was clear that the uh, Cabinet <coughs> Cent uh, Secretary was not happy with the decision, uh, I stopped that process uh, continuing. 
and that dissatisfaction about the decision, presumably due to process, was that on the 8th? I'd have to consult my diary. I don't have it with me in terms of the exact date. Uh, I mean, it seems an incredibly compressed period within which this was this took place. I, I'm not sure that it is, actually, and it's no more compressed than uh, the time it took for him to go and leave in the first place. I have to say, Mr Flanagan, you know, having read the various documents and so on that are here, this seems to be just a continuation of what this committee has uh, discussed with yourself in the past, and it just seems to be extremely poor governance, poor process, and I can see nothing here that shows that uh, any sort of open and transparent process was followed. I, I think you have to recognise that uh, while this is the Chief Constable we're talking about, he remains uh, an employee, he is, a, is somebody who is an individual, he's entitled to the same uh, I'm more concerned protections. about the procedures of the board, how the board handled it, how you yourself handled it. It seems to have been just rushed through without stakeholders being properly informed and engaged. And I, I, just, I just find it quite extraordinary, at the first step given of, the sensitivities. At the first step of that engagement process, uh, which was planned, uh, there became a problem and therefore the process was halted. But... That pro surely there would have been, you should have engaged stakeholders prior to the board meeting to take that decision so that the board was fully, ad fully informed of the position of different parties involved in this. And I'm not just talking about only the Scottish Government, I mean, there's other parties involved as well from the point of view of governance of this board. Okay, I, think we've, I think we've rehearsed this. Do you want to? No, I was going to say that, that just uh, that, that engagement plan was in, in place, and as soon as it started, with the Cabinet Secretary being the first person to be engaged, <coughs> and there, we had a, an issue, then the Board was informed that that was a problem, and that, that issue... But actions were taken the... before stakeholders were advised. In other words, press releases were being agreed, letters issued to the Chief Constable. I mean, it's fait accompli. Due process was uh, scheduled. You need to have a due process to, to go through that. That has to uh, continue. Um, but, you know, again, it ultimately, uh, the, the position is that it is an SPA decision and therefore it is advising those stakeholders. Yeah. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Mr Flanagan, in, uh, I'd just like to lead on from Colin Beatty's line of questioning in, and take you to the meeting with the Cabinet Secretary on the 9th of November. The first meeting <coughs> was you and he only. That's correct, is it? Yes, that's correct. And neither of you took any notes whilst you were in that meeting? No, it was a very short meeting. It only lasted about 15 minutes. And uh, as far as you're aware, neither of you noted anything down at all? No. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has been very clear that the SPA didn't have any plan to protect the well-being of officers and the staff who had raised complaints uh, or played a role in investigation of matters. Is he correct? Did the SPA really not have a plan around the well-being of officers? No, we, we had to discuss this in some detail, but as I said in my earlier uh, comments, uh, our view was that in order to get the robust plan that the uh, Cabinet Secretary then requested, you would actually have to involve the participants in this. And we could only involve the participants once they knew of the circumstances. But so your view is you did have a plan? We had, there we there had, was a welfare plan? We, we had, had discussed discuss the issues of the extent of them, uh, how they might be resolved. But as I said, until you, if you want to have a formalised plan, uh, the best way to do that is to engage with and have the uh, input of those people who will be affected by that plan. And that would include the senior team at uh, Police Scotland, it would have included uh, the complainants, it would have included uh, the Chief Constable himself, and we could really only engage with him once he was back in place. And it would also have involved the HR director who had uh, previous experience of similar situations. Uh, so Dr Marchant, is uh, the Cabinet Secretary correct then that uh, when Mr Flanagan was in that meeting, the SPA had failed to put a, an appropriate plan in place, is that correct? I, I think it, it is, um, as Mr Flanagan has said, that um, 
there was a process for um, discussions, follow-up discussions that were going to be had that day. As he said, the, the start of the process was the discussion with the Cabinet Secretary. The process was then paused at that point. So um, there were plans in place to have those additional conversations and to work out those, to have the detailed plans put in place. Were the, these plans written down anywhere? There was um, a, a list of what the process was for that day. Uh, that's not quite what I asked, no. Dr. Marchin. The welfare plans that the Cabinet Secretary says that the SPA failed to, yeah. to put in place sufficiently mm. at that point, uh, you say there were some plans in place. They must have been written down, or were they in Mr. Flanagan's mind? No, I actually said there was a, a process that was written down that would lead to the establishment of detailed plans, and that was actually for um, conversations to be had with those stakeholders to seek their input in putting together a detailed plan. And can we have a copy of that? The process? Yeah, what was written down? The plans. The plans. Well, no, I haven't called them plans. Let's be clear, I said there was a process in place. What was written down then? Yeah, again, I will take that back to SPA. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr Flanagan, the, the first meeting you had, uh, I think you described earlier that the Cabinet Secretary had told you that uh, the Board, presumably, had made a, 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 I think you said, a bad decision. What exactly did he say to you? Well, that, that, that was the key point. He then asked about how we had arrived at this, mm -hmm. this, this decision, and I started to explain the, the issues that we had, how we had come to that point. Uh, and uh, he, he still felt that it was uh, the wrong decision. So, as I said, it was a very short uh, discussion because I had to leave for committee. But he did make a value judgment about the substance of your decision? I believe so, yes. Uh, did the Cabinet Secretary tell you, either at that first meeting or indeed the second meeting, to change your mind? No, it wasn't uh, that uh, explicit, no. So why did you change your mind? Well, as I said uh, in my earlier answer, I think that uh, for the Chief Constable to return, it would be best that it was in the most conducive situation possible. If the Cabinet Secretary was unhappy for reasons that I didn't understand, I thought it was best to try to resolve those issues before uh, he returned. But the Cabinet Secretary must have been incredibly persuasive if you changed the decision, a unanimous decision, of the Board. Well, he had asked for these two things. I thought that both of those things could be fulfilled, uh, and then relatively uh, quickly, and therefore I thought it wasn't going to lead to an extensive delay. And on the question of the second meeting, so uh, this, this was a much more planned meeting. Not, uh, from my, not from my point of view. <coughs> but you were aware it was going to... No, I was, I was approached when I came out of committee and asked to go back to the Cabinet Secretary's office. And in that office there were three officials? There were three officials, yes. Do you recall who they were? Uh, it, uh, it was the director, the deputy director, and one official I didn't know. And at no stage did any of those... So there were five individuals in the meeting, including yourself. At no stage did anyone make any notes of what was transacted in that meeting? I don't recall seeing notes being taken. Um, I'm, uh, that said, I, I've had many meetings with the Cabinet Secretary, with officials present, and I don't record, re remember any formal record being made of those meetings. Yeah, a formal record. Can you just qualify that? Is that uh, does that include informal records, just people noting stuff down as it's transacted? In the, in the normal course, they may have had notebooks that they might have noted something, follow-up or, or something like that. But um, but you didn't notice anyone I, doing I that? Didn't, I didn't notice anything specific. Would you expect minutes to be taken, Mr Flanagan? No. No. No, I'm good. No, okay. Ian Gray. Um, uh, uh, Mr Flanagan, I'd like to uh, follow on from Liam Kerr's questioning about um, how we got from the morning of the 9th, at which point a decision had been made, a unanimous decision of the board, to the end, I'm not sure exactly what time on the 9th, at which point that decision de facto had been 
reverse, the Chief Constable had been asked not to return. Um, so Mr Kerr has gone through the, the two meetings. Um, I would like to ask, when you came out of the second meeting, at what point you decided to stop the return of the Chief Constable? And to what degree anybody else was involved in that decision, specifically other members of the board? It would have been that, that afternoon. I, uh, um, I, I think I emailed the board to, to say that there had been uh, an adverse reaction from the Cabinet Secretary. And I, had, I phoned the Chief Constable and uh, said that we should postpone. So could I ask Dr Martin, as a member of the board, when you recollect hearing of the change and, and the nature of that message? Um, I concur with what Mr Flanagan has said, that um, the board, in my recollection, is the board received an email to say that we were pausing this. But that was not something which involved you in that decision. That was a, a communication to you from Mr Flanagan of the decision that he had taken. That was a communication from Mr. Flanagan, yes, but yes. I, th I think I said that I would recommend. I can't remember the details of the. So I'm going from memory here, but I think I, I said that I recommend that we um, uh, pause the the situation, and uh, I, I don't recall anyone coming back with a differing view. But did you did you give them a time to return to you with a view, or you re you re recommended that, but then acted <coughs> acted on that? Did they have the opportunity to come back to you and say, or would they have had to have done that instantaneously? I, I believe I, some of them did. I, I don't know that, it, that everyone did, uh, but uh, a number of them came back. Okay. You, you said in answer to Mr Kerr earlier on that you were pausing the decision and felt that the uh, difficulties or concerns that the Cabinet Secretary had expressed could be readily resolved. Uh, you've talked, for example, about getting a view from from Perk. If that had been the case, if you'd been right, then when we'd have imagined what would have happened is that there would have been a short pause and then you'd have continued with the, the board's plan of action, which was for the chief constable to return. So why, why has that not happened? I, I think uh, for, for me, of course, it was uh, the last uh, couple of weeks before I stood down. Um, I, I think that uh, we had further discussions. Uh, I, I had discussions uh, with, uh, along with Dr. Marchin and officials the following day. Uh, I, I think uh, from my own point of view, I think uh, my, I, my feeling was, and I'd have to say that it was a feeling, an impression, that it would have been perhaps better for the new chair to take the issue forward rather than me, uh, that perhaps uh, a fresh pair of eyes might have uh, been more convincing to the Cabinet Secretary uh, than my own view. So if, if we look at what happened on that day, uh, you went into the day with a unanimous board decision. This is the 9th of November. You met with the Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary <coughs> indicated to you that, in his view, the board had taken a bad decision. You met later uh, with the Cabinet Secretary in which he expressed a number of concerns about the process and the way in which the decision had been reached. You then, quite quickly after that, having informed board members by email that you, you intended to do this, stopped the process which was underway of the return of the Chief Constable. Uh, the convener asked you earlier on, Mr Flanagan, whether you felt that the Cabinet Secretary was directing you to stop the process. Uh, will you accept that if you look at that objectively, it's quite difficult not to conclude that you felt the Cabinet Secretary was telling you to stop this process? I, I think direction is a, is a more formal term, uh, and I couldn't say that I had been directed to. But uh, the position I was in, I felt I wasn't in a position to move forward with that decision. So you felt you had no choice but to pause the decision? Yes. Thank you. Let me follow on from that briefly, Mr Flanagan. What would have happened if you'd left uh, the building that day and had not changed your mind? Well, I would have, firstly, I, I would still have had to brief uh, my colleagues on the board. 
and again their views on what we should do and so whether or not we should press ahead. Uh, I would also <coughs> wanted to consult with the chief constable and see what his view was because again uh, we need the parties uh, to be comfortable and happy with the circumstances in, that are arising. Uh, I mean, with regard to how the Cabinet Secretary felt about it, if you hadn't changed your mind? Well, I think if we, if, if we hadn't changed our mind, as a board, and again, I would stress it's we, it's not me. Uh, uh, if we had agreed that it was important, and, and some, uh, from again, from recollection, some members did raise the point as to whether or not we should press ahead. Um, and therefore, um, uh, I think uh, we've, we feel independent enough as individuals that if that was our considered position, then we would have uh, continued with the process. Alex Neil. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the earlier remarks, Dr Marchant referred to a board meeting on the 31st of October that first considered reinstatement of the Chief Constable. Is that correct? Uh, no, not reinstatement. That was discussing the continuation of a leave of absence. Right. Okay, so for the board meeting and the agenda for the 7th of November, we've heard that this vital item was taken under AOCB, but where the board members informed that there would be tabled at that meeting a proposal to reinstate the Chief Constable. Were they given advance notice that that specific proposal was on the agenda? I don't have, I, I can't recollect whether that is or is not the case. I, I, as the deputy chair, had had discussions with the chair and was aware of it. I, I don't have records to show whether or not other board members were or were not aware of what the discussion was going to be on the 7th of November. But you're the deputy chair of this organisation and you're telling me the most vital decision you've had to make in months, if not years, you cannot recall if board members were informed of advance, in advance of the meeting, that there would be a proposal table to reinstate the chief constable. Are you being serious? Are you seriously expecting me to believe that you don't know that? No, what I'm actually saying is I, I don't know if there was a formal, um, a formal communication to the other board members on the 31st of October meeting, the discussion posed around um, the, uh, the the discussion. Sorry, I'm just trying to be very careful with the, with the words I'm using. Apologies. Um, the discussion on the 31st of October was regarding the continuing leave of absence, and we also always discussed the welfare issues of complainers and complainees. At that discussion. Then there was the discussion around, as Mr. Flanagan had referred to, the NPCC, the redeployment um, opportunity. And there was a discussion then regarding um, what information we required in order to make a more informed decision regarding that and continuation of the leave of absence. So yes, there was an expectation that this would then be brought back to a future meeting, and um, that meeting would have been the 7th of November. To a future meeting, but were board members not told that it was to that meeting eight days later? Sorry, um, yes, they were t advised that it was at that meeting on the 7th it of November. It was to be tabled? Yes. And um, that the, the responses to the questions that had been posed would come back to the meeting on the 7th of November. So can I ask, was the Chief Constable given any advance notice that this was to be discussed on the 7th of November meeting? He, I think he, the chair. He wasn't given uh, precise details of when the board would come to a conclusion, but at the earlier meeting I had been asked to seek the Chief Constable's position and whether or not he was open to returning to work. But was the Chief Constable told that this proposal would be or might be tabled at the 7th of November meeting? Not the, not the details of, of the 7th of December, but uh, that... Uh, November. We, sorry, November. But we were we wanted his views on whether or not uh, he was willing to return to work, so he would have been aware that we were discussing and considering that issue. So the Chief Constable was aware, the Acting Chief Constable wasn't aware, Pert wasn't aware, and the Cabinet Secretary wasn't aware? 
And we're not, we're not absolutely sure even the board members were aware they're going, we were going to be discussing this on the 7th of November. I, I believe that the, all the board members were aware that they were going to discuss uh, this on the, uh, on the 7th. All of the board members knew that we had to arrive at a decision either to uh, extend the leave or return the Chief Constable to work. So there was no doubt or dubiety in the minds of the board members about what the discussion was going to be. So how many board members were there at that time? I know there's been recent recruitments uh, to the board, but how many people were entitled to turn up as board members on the 7th of November? 11, I think. And how many turned up? Well, from uh, the minutes, uh, there was two apologies, so it was nine. And what's, what's the quorum? Uh, it's uh, a majority of those present. A major that can't be the quorum, a majority of those present. I mean, if two folk turn so, up... Sorry, sorry, yes. A, a quorum is six, I think. A quorum is six. So, so it was quorum. Yes. Right. yes. So, after the meeting, um, obviously the Chief Constable was informed. At what stage was the Chief Constable informed of the decision of the board to invite him back to start work again on the Friday? I think on the Wednesday he was in. So he was told on the Wednesday? Yes. Was that before or after you had your conversation with the acting Chief Constable Ian Livingston? No, I didn't have a conversation with Chief, the act, well, the DCC designate uh, until uh, the Thursday. Right, well, the, Mr Livingston gave evidence to, he gave evidence to the Justice Committee on Tuesday. And what he says is, I had some, I had no conversations with the Cabinet Secretary. I had some communication with the then Chair of the SBA on the evening of Tuesday the 7th of November, the day of the board meeting. I asked Andrew Flanagan for an update on the police authorities' meeting. I knew there had been a meeting and I felt it was important to get that update because I had a responsibility to the men and women, officers and staff within Police Scotland, should there be a change in Phil Gormley's circumstances. I did not get a reply to that, and on the Wednesday, I was told that, this is by you, on the Wednesday, not the Thursday, that, quote, deliberations were ongoing. Is that correct? Well, as I said, uh, the, for me, the first step was to uh, advise the Cabinet Secretary. I would then have spoken to uh, the DCC designate. Well... Would it not therefore have been more appropriate and more accurate to have said to the Acting Chief Constable when he asked you on the Wednesday morning, I, I need to speak to the Cabinet Secretary first and then I will contact you as the Acting Chief Constable? Perhaps I... I, I mean, I, to I, say deliberations were ongoing at that stage... Well, I hadn't spoken to the Chief Constable at that point to, see, to confirm that he would return. So the sequence on the Wednesday, you said you hadn't spoken to Ian Livingston until the Thursday. Ian Livingston says you spoke to him on the Wednesday. So do you now accept it was the Wednesday you spoke yep. to Ian Livingston? I accept that. Yeah. So what was the sequence? Did you speak to Phil Gormley before you spoke to Ian Livingston or did you speak to Ian Livingston before you spoke I, to Phil I, Gormley? I'll bet you don't remember. Well, uh, I don't remember in which so order. There's a surprise. Place. You don't remember. Uh, the amnesia that's around the Scottish Police Authority is beyond belief. We had that the last time about nine months ago. So basically, what, what basically the Acting Chief Constable is saying, Mr Flanagan, is, in words of one syllable, you lied to him. No, I don't think I did. Well, that's what he's implying. I, I didn't have a firm conclusion at that point. But deliberations weren't ongoing at the board. The board had taken a decision. Surely the honest thing to do would have been to say to the acting chief constable, who's responsible, as he quite rightly says, for the welfare of all those who work in Police Scotland at that time, uh, to tell him that I can't <coughs> tell you at the moment what the decision is until I've spoken to the uh, chief constable, Mr Gormley, and to the cabinet secretary, but I'll ring you back in the afternoon once I've done that. Surely that would have been the professional way to handle that. I... I don't recall the details of the, uh, the call. Uh, I, I, I thought it best to advise the Cabinet Secretary first, and in the event, that turned out to be a wise decision. So when did you ask for a meeting with the Cabinet Secretary? I think it was asked for on the Wednesday, but it actually was uh, set for the Thursday morning because I was going to be through uh, in Edinburgh for the, uh, the committee meeting. Yeah. 
you didn't think it was important enough to inform the Cabinet Secretary in the Tuesday evening or sometime in the Wednesday of what the Board's decision had been? Well, the last time I had met with the, the, the Cabinet Secretary, we had uh, talked about uh, the Chief Constable situation. There was no indication that this was going to be a significant issue. Well, I, obviously I wasn't party to that. I can't answer that. But by the time you spoke to the Cabinet Secretary, is it not the case the Chief Constable, Mr Gormley, had already left his home in Norwich and was driving to Scotland? I don't know the Chief Constable's travel arrangements, sorry. But is it, you do know that he, he had to he turn was, back he was expected, in the middle of his journey. I saw that reported in the press, but I don't know the details of that. I, I know that uh, So when you uh, spoke to expected. Mr Gormley, he wasn't in his car? I don't I, I, I don't know whether he was in his car or not. But Mr Gormley's lawyers, I think, have confirmed that he had to turn back because he was already on his way. So he was already on his way to Scotland to take up his duties the next day before you told the Cabinet Secretary and you hadn't even by then told the acting Chief Constable, let alone Perk. Is it not the case that in his previous uh, expressions of concern about governance in the Scottish Police Authority, that the Chief Inspector of uh, the Constabulary had already advised the Scottish Police Authority that it had to um, improve its governance around these matters? There were some recommendations from HMICS and I believe they were implemented. Well, well, those recommendations not including that in circumstances like this, there has to be, before any final decision is taken, preparate before, not after the decision is taken, appropriate consideration has to be given in discussions with the PERC in relation to the welfare of those who work in Police Scotland and other appropriate stakeholders consulted. I don't recall any recommendations of that, that nature on this. So, the, so you're saying the, 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 the inspector the rec had never made such recommendations? The, the last time, I believe, there were recommendations from uh, the uh, HMICS was in the transparency review in June and the forensics review around the same time. Uh, there was no comment from HMICS that I recall on particular issues around the return of the Chief Constable. Is it not the case that the, a previous private board meeting, the, the inspector had made these comments? And had followed them up by email. I don't. I don't remember that. Can, can I just Hello? also? Uh, you mentioned this morning. You made reference to when the chief constable came back. You made a fleeting reference to work for the National Police Chief Council, which I believe is a UK body. Yes. So that's can right. you clarify? Which seems again to contradict what's in the press release that SPA were going to release on the Chief Constable's reinstatement, where it says he'll be re re returning to operational duties, implication being operational duties at Police Scotland. Can you clarify, what was he returning to? Was he, was he going to be returning full-time to operational duties in Police Scotland? And what, what's the reference to the National Police Chief Council? What's that all about? Uh, we were asked uh, in early October, mid-October, around about that time, whether or not we would agree to uh, the Chief Constable uh, going to do work on a specific project for <coughs> the NPCC. Um, when uh, the, the Chief Executive was asked to explore what that was about and what, what that meant, and it turned out to be a full-time involvement uh, over a nine-month period. Uh, and we did not think that that was appropriate for the Chief Constable. So to be doing. clear, if he was returning, he was going to be returning to full operational duties, yes. full time with Police Scotland. Yes, okay. because we didn't we didn't believe that it was appropriate for um, the Chief Constable to be paid uh, for his normal role, but then yeah. conducting work on behalf of the NPCC. But it indicated to us that that therefore meant that he felt that he was fit and able to do a full time job. Can I just finally, because I think I'm running out of time from the convener, ask a final question to both Dr. March and <coughs> Mr. Hume. You're both non-executive directors of the SPA board. Uh, over the last nine months, we've heard what a pantomime it is and the, the poor governance. We've had the auditor's report 
and we have had um, you know crisis after crisis. We've heard this morning how you all come unprepared to this meeting, can't answer basic questions, you haven't brought your notes, you haven't brought your minutes, you don't seem to be well prepared at all. Is it not time for you to, as well as some of the other non-executive directors who have been part of this pantomime, to fall on their sword? We listen to input um, as you, from yourselves and obviously from HMICS and as a personal individual, I take that input very seriously and um, that's... You can't be proud of this record. I mean, the non-executives have utterly failed in their duty. Utterly failed in their duty. You can't be proud of that record, are you? I am, my view is that there are always areas of improvement on both the governance and, every, um, and the processes we continue to strive to improve. We accept the findings of HMICS and Audit Scotland's reports. David Hume. <clears throat> um, I, I agree with the, the comments that Nicola Marchant has made. Um, there are improvements, and if you read the annual audit report and the Section 22 report, uh, you will see in their acknowledgement that improvements are being made. And I know uh, from those areas that I'm involved in that there are obvious improvements uh, and with the um, the movement into a, the new chair taking post and the new chief officer taking post, I think these improvements will continue. Um, I, I don't accept in, in whole what you're saying. Um, I, a, some things have been said this morning that I don't recognise in terms of how the board went about its business. Um, we took this matter extremely seriously. Um, uh, we knew, because of the four-week cycle of the renewal of this leave of absence, that the <coughs> board had to take a decision. Um, and we knew uh, on the 31st of October that we'd be coming back uh, to a convened meeting on the 7th of November. Uh, that meeting uh, was uh, duly um, called and held. Uh, we had the principal advisor to the board in the form of the chief executive there. <coughs> There were no proposals tabled at that meeting. Um, it was the same issue that we had talked about in previous four weekly meetings, which was, uh, does the Chief Constable's leave of absence continue? Um, as always, we uh, very thoroughly went through a number of basic considerations that allowed us to take that view. Uh, we always talked about the safe, uh, the welfare arrangements for the other members of staff and the chief constable. We had uh, directed the chief executive to consult with the PERC um, because, in terms of the the options that we were facing, uh, we uh, could con continue the chief constable's leave of absence. Uh, we could move to suspension or he could return to work. Um, and in making uh, those judgments, we were mindful of the regulations that set out the criteria for suspension. And that's why uh, we directed the chief executive uh, to stay in contact with PERC uh, so that we would have a view about any potential uh, interference with the investigation, because that is one of the two criteria for suspension. The other criterion is in relation to the public interest, whether there would be a, a public interest driver for suspension. So at the meeting on the 7th of November, there was no proposal tabled. There was a recognition that we had by dint of that timetable to make a decision uh, about the uh, position of the Chief Constable. Um, again, uh, we reflected on the welfare arrangements uh, again, we reflected uh, on the view from the Chief Executive Officer about the role of PERC. Um, at can, that can, time... Can, sorry uh, to interrupt you, but sorry. you say there was no proposal tabled to reinstate the Chief Constable. Have I taken you correctly? Well, as I understand what, what that phrase means, there was no proposal. We didn't go into that meeting um, aware, or I, I don't think anybody had reached that decision point so how, before the how meeting. did that in the meeting then how did that proposal come about well I, the 
sorry to repeat myself, but the context for the meeting was the four-week review, and we knew we had to come to a view. The options in front of us were clear. The options were, uh, under the terms of the regulations, a... Uh, no, no, you've gone you've through all of that. Yeah. How, how did... How did, I mean, pres did, presumably your legal advice at this board meeting, had you? Uh, we didn't have legal advice, but we had surprise. previously uh, on, on these issues, when uh, previous No, but we are considering these options clearly. So anyway, leaving aside well, the absence of legal advice, who proposed the reinstatement of the chief constable? It was a consensus of the board, having gone through no, the somebody process. Had to no. say, somebody had to say, surely, I propose. I mean, I mean, if you're taking a decision at any board meeting, and I've been to a lot of boards, you pro somebody has to propose the reinstatement, that there are three options, and somebody surely has to say at some point, I propose that we go for that option, reinstatement to the chief constable. There was a discussion about the, um, the feedback through John Foley from Perk. There was a, d a discussion about the public interest matter. We were aware but, but, but of the Parker discussion. The, no, we were aware of the discussion you have just had about the MPCC. Um, certainly, as a board member, I felt in that meeting I had got to the point of thinking the conditions for suspension were not met. Um, the chief constable had declared that the reason that he wanted leave had ended. And I felt that on the basis that we talked about with the MPCC, um, it was in the public interest. I, I, couldn't, I felt I couldn't justify a continuation of special leave I, I need, when, I need, I need when to, he ought to be back at I work. need to wind up, but just for the record, the, the, in writing we have it from Perth, they, they were not consulted about the reinstatement proposal. I'm sorry, I can, right. I can only tell you what I expected at that meeting. So you were told they had been consulted? No. Can I, can I, can I, I think that uh, you're absolutely correct, Mr Neil. Um, I certainly didn't consult with the park in relation to that. My recollection of what happened at the, the meeting uh, where that decision was taken is that I was going on leave uh, two days later. So I took an action from the meeting to uh, write the letter uh, to the Chief Constable, which I did, and I know you've got a copy of that. But the, uh, my recollection of actions was that the Chair was to uh, communicate with the Park as well as the Cabinet Secretary uh, and the Chief Constable. But, but, I, but, but I was to maintain regular contact with the Park, which I always the, did. Yeah, but surely the yeah. sequence was important as well. I mean, the, surely... In, when there's any investigation going on anywhere of a disciplinary nature and you're talking about reinstatement, the first thing you would do, I would have thought, is check with the view of the person investigating the complaints about whether it was appropriate for the person to be reinstated at that stage. Park have said no such consultation took place. That's correct. That's damning as well as correct. Several of the meetings that you refer to, the board meeting of the 31st, we've just checked, there's a note saying it was it was a closed uh, meeting. I think we're looking for the minute of 7th of November. It was agreed at the 20th of November, but it's not public. Now, I know, Mr Flanagan, you have since stepped down, but a theme throughout your uh, chairmanship has been this issue about secrecy. Uh, you know, th in retrospect, do you feel there's been so many comments today about, oh, I think I recollect that, or I'm not sure about that. Was there a meet was there a minute? No, th there wasn't. Do you regret that this whole process under your chairmanship hasn't been more, wasn't more transparent? I think we, um, we do document things properly. Um, I, I think uh, Dr. Marchant has confirmed that there are minutes of those meetings. I well, they're certainly not on the website. I, I don't think. I mean, I, it would stand to be corrected, but they don't seem to be publicly available. I, the, the practice of uh, uh, is supposed to be that once we've had closed meetings at the next public meeting, we report the business that was conducted and the, any decisions that were made. So that, but that uh, was after I had left, I believe. So. Okay, uh, Dr. Marchant and David Hume. I mean. There were concerns raised about lack of transparency and privacy by a previous board member. Were these concerns that you share, shared at the time and share now? David Hume. Uh, yes. Um, I, I, going back almost a, a year, 
Um, I indicated that I had concerns. Um, I indicated that we should embark on um, a, a review of these arrangements from a, a, the position of a comparing the uh, standards of governance in the SPA um, with the best available international standards of, of uh, governance. So you made those concerns clear to Mr Flanagan? Uh, yes. Privately, because there's no minute of that, is there? I think there are several minutes, and I think I may be wrong, but I think even here I mentioned it when I was here okay. a year ago, um, and and that was just to say again, if I may, I, briefly that that was uh, there's an international um, standard for good governance that the International um, Chartered Accountant. Uh, Federation, okay. I think, developed with SITFA. Okay. And that's the one that I wanted to use. The then chair agreed that I would. And I have actually developed um, a, from that standard a framework for the measurement of okay. the government standards okay. in the SPA. Well, I think we're all hopeful that this issue will improve um, going forward. Daniel Johnson. Well, firstly, can I thank the convener for, for bringing me in at this point uh, as a, a, a member that's not a member of this committee. I, I do appreciate that. Um, I, I'd just really like to try to establish the facts of, of the meetings that have occurred and, and what was discussed. Um, in particular, Mr Flanagan, you, you said that at the previous meeting that you'd had with the Cabinet Secretary prior to the 7th, that you discussed the, the situation of the Chief Constable. Indeed, uh, I was wondering how many meetings you'd had with the Cabinet Secretary um, from the point at which the, the Chief Constable went on special leave and, and indeed the, the, the meeting of the 7th. And, and how many times would you say that that situation had been discussed? Um, the Cabinet Secretary and I typically would meet every four to six weeks. Uh, so the, um, the Chief went on leave beginning of September. Um, I think I had a meeting in September and I had a meeting in October. So, so you met on a number of occasions and, and, and you discussed the situation of the Chief Constable. Can I ask, what, what sorts of questions was the Cabinet Secretary asking around the process? What sort of interest was he taking? It, it was an important issue. Uh, you know, we, the absence of the Chief Constable for an extended period of time is uh, challenging for everyone. Uh, there are certain powers vested in the Chief Constable that are not transferable. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we'd already had a, a situation where the previous Chief Constable was absent for about f four months and we mm -hmm. had a designate in place at that point. Uh, um, so everyone is concerned that uh, there shouldn't be a prolonged period of uncertainty. Uh, and the discussion in October, if I recall correctly, uh, was around uh, the length of time that the PERC investigation was taking whether or not the police regulations, uh, which combine police standards with employment standards and management standards, uh, were fit for purpose. It was a discussion around those things. We didn't discuss the specifics of the, uh, the complaints themselves. Uh, but you did discuss the process indeed. I mean, would you say the Cabinet Secretary was aware that you were reviewing um, the, the matter on a, a four-weekly basis? And, and was he aware that you had the the, the, the list and, uh, and of uh, procedural steps that, that, that Dr. Marchant set up. Was he familiar with those I things? I think that the, this, the procedural steps came later. Uh, at, the, at the time of the meeting, it was probably about uh, the second week of October, so we were not in a period where we were running up to the review of the, uh, of the temporary leave, so there was nothing specific in that. Um, but uh, later on, uh, we had the discussions with uh, Dr. March and I had discussions with officials more about the generalities of the situation and the, in our uh, uh, view, some concerns about the, the, the long-term structure of, of the senior command, uh, the lack of succession planning, um, <clears throat> possible outcomes for the, uh, uh, the complaint process itself and what would happen in those circumstances. So we had those discussions with uh, the director uh, for safe communities end of October, something like that. So, so had the cabinet secretary in any of those meetings or indeed any of his officials raised the, 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 the matter of these two requests as a, a condition in their view of uh, a satisfactory return for the chief constable? No, 
than raise them in any of those no. situations. So can I just then focus on, on the meeting? And there were two meetings on the 9th of November. I believe that's new information. I, I don't know if that's new or not, but yes, there were two. Sorry. So, sorry, this is the meeting with the Cabinet Secretary. Yes, there's two meetings with so the Cabinet Secretary. one that you request and then one that he subsequently requested. Yes. And the first of those meetings, he, you, you, you said that the Cabinet Secretary described your decision as a, a bad decision. What did he say that the consequences were of that bad decision? And, and did he say that there were anything that he felt should happen a, a, as a result of, of his indicating that it was a bad decision? Uh, I think uh, he indicated that he thought it was a risk uh, to the stability of the senior team. Uh, and that's why I, th I think I referred to earlier a discussion that I had with him about stability of the senior team. And I had a different view from that. Um, was there anyone else present at that first meeting? No. So it was just you and the Cabinet Secretary. And at the second meeting, you said there were th three officials there. But that must have felt like quite a, an, a, an official meeting at that point, with that number of, of civil servants present, as well as the Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, yes, uh, I, I suspect uh, uh, it, felt, it felt rather one-sided, if I would put it that way. And you, and you said that you felt that, that, that you couldn't have made any other course of action other than the recommended one, other, uh, otherwise that you would have uh, displeased the Cabinet Secretary and, and that was not something that was acceptable. <coughs> is, that, is, is that sort of the fair characterisation of what happened? No, I don't, I don't think it is. I don't, I don't think my role is to please or otherwise the, the Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, I guess don't. what I'm trying to ask is, is did you, do you feel you had any other course of action available to you other than what had been recommended and requested? Because the issue... The issues were characterised in terms of process, then I had to make a judgement as to whether or not those process issues could be dealt with and hopefully, uh, as I said earlier, create a more conducive atmosphere to the return of the, uh, the Chief Constable. As I assessed at the time, uh, I thought those matters could be resolved relatively quickly uh, and uh, therefore uh, I decided that uh, the best course of action was to pause and see if we could resolve those issues. The reason I ask is that yesterday the Cabinet Secretary said that, that if you had not acquiesced to his request, that he would have felt compelled to invoke his powers under the statute to, to direct. It just strikes me that under those situation, that situation, you really would have felt uh, that there was no other course of action. I just... I just well, if, if, if he invoked his powers, of, I mean, he is the, the Cabinet Secretary and therefore he can override uh, in, in that situation. Uh, I think that's a, a, a very big step. Uh, uh, but you have to also recall, it's, it's not from my point of view, uh, you know, um, I, I, was a, I had already resigned. I was in the last two or three weeks of my, my departure. If I thought that that was the right course of action, I would have felt obliged to do it. Uh, and there, therefore, if it, if it was a case that it had to be a political decision, not for the return of the Chief Constable, then... Um, <coughs> That would have been clear, and everybody should understand that. Uh, what I don't think is is correct is that somehow that there is it's pushed back to the to the SPA uh, in a situation where I don't think now it is it's clear what the basis of the chief constable's current absence is. That's not that, that you know the risk of an interpretation or perspe perspective or presumption that there has been uh, some sort of political decision, but it's not overt is not uh, how it should happen. If the chief, uh, if the, the cabinet secretary wishes to make that direction, then he should make it. If you could wind up, please. I, I mean, I'm just really trying to, to, I would be interested in your opinion of what, what you really think the difference between a request and a, and a direction is, whether or not that's a direction in the formal sense or otherwise. As I said, he didn't request that, uh, the, the, he said that he thought that there were steps that we should be taking before it should take place. So my judgment at that point was that we could uh, do those things and that therefore that was better than a situation that was more conf confrontational at that stage. The request is his words rather than mine. Uh, request was the word he used in the, in, the, um, in the chamber when he made his statement, the Cabinet Secretary. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask again about the wellbeing plan in the process for putting that in place. Um, you said, Dr Merchant, that the process is written down and 
it would lead to a plan being put in place to to deliver the well-being for the staff, all the staff involved. Uh, was that discussed at the board meeting on the 7th of November? And was there due consideration given as to whether there was sufficient time to put that into place before the Chief Constable's return? Just to be clear, the, the process that I'm talking about is a, a series of conversations that would enable that plan to be put in place. Um, on the 7th of November, the um, well-being, welfare and the well-being of individuals was discussed and um, it was agreed that that would be form part of the enabling um, bef uh, that would ha happen bef prior to the Chief Constable starting work. But was there an agreement that there was sufficient time to deliver <coughs> that, given that you had taken the decision on the, at the board meeting to reinstate the Chief Constable, who was then going to return to work only three days later? The view was that um, once those conversations had been had, then those were the individuals who could best inform as to whether or not around the time consideration. But as Mr Flanagan has said, those conversations did not take place. The Deputy Chief Constable told the Justice Committee that by Wednesday the 8th he still didn't know about any welfare plans being put in place. And at that point, the Chief Constable was returning to duty two days later. Are you honestly saying that there was sufficient time to ensure the welfare of all the staff that are involved in this, to, to ensure that that happened in time before the Chief Constable returned to duty? What I'm saying is that those conversations were going to be had. If there was a concern raised, then I'm sure I would have gone back to the chair and asked for the board to reconsider their position. But I had not had those conversations. So the Chief Constable could have returned to duty on Friday the 10th, and the welfare plan may still not have been delivered or implemented across the service? That isn't what I said. What I actually said but was... Do you, do you think that's the case? Could you... No, I don't so think So it would all have been done and dusted in two days? No, I actually said that I would have had the conversations which would have given, enabled me to make an informed decision on with the, with the um, welfare plan, and if I had concern of it, I would have raised that with the chair and the rest of the board. Thank you. Okay. Ian Gray. Um, I'd like to turn now to the to the Session 22 report, the uh, the audit, and um, start with maybe in a way quite a general que question. The, um, the the Section 22 report tells us that in 2016-17, the Scottish Police Authority overspent its budget by just under 17 million pounds. Uh, and that the budget the authority approved for 2017-18, the current financial year, uh, forecast a deficit of over £47 million. Uh, and the Auditor General tells us that indications are that this will indeed be the outturn position. So it, it's hardly a stellar uh, financial performance. And I, I, I wanted to ask um, the panel uh, why they felt it was uh, acceptable to approve a budget with such a large overspend uh, and what options were considered uh, that might have allowed a balanced budget to be achieved? Um, well, the, the first uh, thing is that uh, it, since, uh, since I started in September 2015, uh, there had been a paucity of financial information to allow us to actually determine what the financial situation was in Police Scotland and we had spent most of that first year trying to determine that. I think we actually got to a position where uh, we had much greater degree of clarity in, in terms of what the actual uh, current spending was, what the cost pressures were. Uh, we'd also been able to identify some of the options that were open to us. Um, and really, uh, the, the issues that uh, arise in terms of uh, reducing the costs and bringing them back into balance uh, were quite fundamental and quite long term in terms of their delivery. Uh, uh, the, the three options fall into uh, one, uh, changing the and reducing the number of police officers uh, compared to the mandated uh, criteria of 17234. Uh, and police officers represent police officer payroll costs represent some 65% of the 
the budget, maybe even up to 70%. I'm sure the chief executive can be more precise. Uh, the second was introducing much uh, more effective uh, procurement and purchasing of uh, non-pay items. Uh, and again, because of long-term contracts that were in place, that was going to take some time to effect. And the third area was a complete reform of the back office, uh, which really uh, hadn't been significantly moved on since the creation of Police Scotland in 2013, to the extent that we only had, we, we still had no single payroll system, we had very ineffective uh, HR processes, we had no uh, agreed uh, consistent terms and condition across uh, the, the workforce. All of those issues were going to take some time to uh, 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 resolve. Uh, and we thought that that was going to take three years in total to resolve. We took that position to, to government and we explained the situation. The more immediate, quicker uh, uh, position would have been to start to reduce the police officer numbers because just with normal uh, turnover, retirements, etc., that would have been the, most, the quickest effect. Uh, but uh, government was not willing to contemplate that. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Vera. I'd like to <clears throat> look at the process around the, the settlement that was made to uh, Mr Foley, and hopefully we can get uh, some direct answers on this. On the 17th of August, the Deputy Director for Police Division contacted the SPA Deputy Chair, Dr Marchant, uh, in connection with uh, the pylon issue. And you stated that you'd received clear HR advice on this point. Was that in writing? The HR advice that I received was as part of the preparation for the consultations discussions and was in verbal. I confirmed that the pylon was part, uh, was part of our standard operating procedure and that was confirmed back to me and the standard operating procedure I was shown in writing. So you gave HR details of what was proposed and no. they came, you didn't? No, that was a consultation discussion. The Which means? Sorry, to go back a step, um, the process was on the 7th of June, there was a closed board meeting where there was a proposed business change which would have meant the redundancy of the role of the CEO stroke accountable officer. Um, that was a board discussion. The board supported that proposed business change, which led <coughs> to my being asked to formally write the business case for change, which would enable the start of a consultation as per due process for impacted individuals. That was done, and therefore consultation was started with those that were impacted by the proposed business change. It should be borne in mind that we actually work under a no compulsory redundancy, which means that when there are <coughs> individuals who are impacted because their roles no longer exist in the organization and therefore are redundant, then an individual, any individual, would have an option to volunteer to take redundancy terms and conditions. They have the right to stay in our organization and we would provide them meaningful work, in which case they sit within what's called our supernumerary pool because we have a no compulsory redundancy policy. That person who sits, any person who sits within the supernumerary pool, we provide them meaningful work until either there is a suitable alternative role in the organization, and in this case, there would be very unlikely that there was a suitable alternative role at the level of the CEO. The third element is the individual is given the option to be considered for new roles that appear in the organisation as a consequence of the change. I'm, I'm looking... Yes. Forgive me, Colin. Yes. On that suitable alternative role yes. point, there was a suitable alternative role. There was one paying somewhere between one hundred and seven and £120,000 to do fundamentally the same job that he'd been doing, wasn't there? The interim chief officer role was submitted to Scottish Government as per process for banding and salary. It was banded at a band lower than the CEO role that Mr Foley sat within, and therefore it was a redundancy because it was a band lower than the role he had. He, I don't was... question the redundancy, yes. although I may do it at a later stage. Yes. Uh, I question... Your assertion 
that there was no suitable alternative. There was a suitable alternative. Sorry, uh, to, to, to refact then, there was, uh, that was an option that Mr Foley was asked, uh, as part of consultation, any new role that is created in a, following a business change is looked at as an opportunity for the individual. Cool. Yep, just continuing with this, so the clear HR advice, I'm, talking, I'm looking at Paul Johnson's letter of 18th yes. January here, which lays this out very clearly. So the clear HR advice you received was verbal? The clear HR advice I received was verbal. And the position that they told you was that essentially there was no discretion about the size of the offer? Sorry, to be clear, there, there is an agreed package of VR, VER. There are options then to consider um, how an individual exits the organisation. Okay, but the package of the VR, VER is something that is an approved package that is applied mm. to all individuals that elect to take redundancy. G given the importance of this particular process and the decision that's been taken, wouldn't you have asked HR for something in writing? The VRVER policy is something that has actually goes through the board approval process. So because we were working within the agreed policies and the SOPs, the advice that I sought from HR was uh, to provide an assurance that we were working within our policies and processes. Now, as a result of that advice, you proceeded to make an offer? As a result of that advice... I progressed with HR through consultation. The outcome of the consultation was the offer letter. At what point did the board become aware of what the settlement was? The 11th of August. That was when there was an authorisation requested of the board by Mr Flanagan, who emailed the board with the outcome of the consultation to progress with the settlement offer. Now, the Deputy Director of Police Division emailed yourself on the 23rd of August, highlighting the fact that this could be open to scrutiny. And I think I'm quoting here, it may be worth thinking about what the answer would be to that specific question that you were queried on. Did That's you take that into account? Yes, I did. Um, the at the beginning of the business case for change, there were three business imperatives and business objectives. One of the things was to change as quickly as possible the reporting relationship between forensic services and the board, responding to the recommendation from a June 2017 HMIC, HMICS thematic review of forensic services and a previous 2016 HMICS public advice note. The second the discussion was to secure the business continuity despite the consequential redundancy of the CEO role by recruiting an interim chief officer before the CEO left the organisation. And that was because both the chief officer and the CEO role take on the accountability <coughs> of the accountable officer. The third was to ensure the CEO, as accountable officer, remained in post long enough to complete and present to the board the annual report and accounts, and then leave the organisation immediately thereafter to enable the accountable of officer responsibilities to transfer to a newly appointed interim I'll, I'll come officer. back to these business imperatives in a second. 11th of August was the board meeting at which the decision was taken to approve the package. 17th of August was when you asked HR. Wouldn't you have asked HR first before going to the board? Um, no, I had had conversations during the consultation process as I was accompanied by HR, which commenced on the 27th of July. The consultation process. The so, the 17th, uh, so the 17th of August was not a definitive date as far as no. that's concerned. You know, given the criticism from Audit Scotland and from Paul Johnson, do you think in retrospect that you were correct to proceed in the manner you did? I think as I go back to the business imperatives, it's actually looking at the value for money and also how to achieve, how best to achieve those business imperatives. Well, those business, all three well, business imperatives were achieved with the course of action that was well, taken. Let's look at these three business imperatives. The first was to change as quickly as possible the reporting relationship between forensic services on the board. Yes. Was that 
reliant on the chief executive being in place until that could happen. That, that was reliant. The, the business case for change was proposing that changing in relationship that change in relationship resulted in the role of the CEO becoming redundant and therefore consultation yeah. needed to be progressed <clears throat> before you could change that because the impact of that change in reporting relationship was a redundancy. When did that change take place? The 1st of September. 30th? 1st of First. September. Excuse me, Sorry. March, can I interrupt? It, can the person who's having trouble with the mobile please step outside the committee? So on the first Excuse of me, Colin. Can I ask you to resume, Dr. March? Sorry. You were saying. So yes, to, to confirm, on the first of September, the reporting relationship of forensic services was changed, and so at that time, the role was the role of the CEO was redundant. So first of September, that first business imperative took place. Yes. Mr. Foley was still in position until the thirtieth of November. The second business uh, issue was business continuity. Yes. Rather a, 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 a luxury in most cases to be able to hold a, a double position. So how long did the interim chief officer understudy the previous CEO? The interim chief officer took up his position on the 13th of November. 13th of November? 13th of November. So in fact it was 17 days? Correct. Was that planned in terms of the period? Was it adequate? Um, it was an agreement. The start date was an agreement between the board and the interim chief officer. And it, we had discussions about actually was that um, a, a sufficient handover time. There was obviously um, other um, executives within the SPA team and the board members. And it was being planned on the basis that the accounts would go to the board for approval on the 28th of November. Yep. Now, if I take the third business imperative, well, that didn't happen, because the accounts, were, the accounts uh, according to what I see here, were in fact not signed off until after the CEO departed. No, the accounts no? were approved on the 28th of November board meeting. Which is two days before he left. Correct. So that just came in. What is oh, this? Sorry, can I just point out, actually, just to be clear, we did not, Mr Foley was not actually told that his departure date was the 30th of November until the chair of the audit committee had notified myself and the HR business partner that the audit committee had, were able to recommend the accounts for approval. If the accounts had not been presented to the board on the 28th of November, Mr Foley would not have left on the 30th of November. That was the agreement that we had. He would stay in role until the accounts had been approved and signed off by the board. Mm, interesting. What, I was going to ask about the accelerated consultation process. What is the yes. accelerated consultation process? How is it documented and how is it monitored? The consultation process, consultation, minute, uh, consultation meetings are minuted and uh, documented by the HR business partner. What the accelerated means is that with the support of Mr Foley, our processes would normally have meant that Mr Foley had one week's notice of actually coming to a consultation meeting. Mr Foley wrote to me to say that he would, um, uh, he would, he requested that that be accelerated and he met with him earlier. We then expedited that as fast as possible so that consultation took approximately four weeks. Um, and, and in normal processes within Police Scotland, according to the guidance that they have, consultation would take 12 and a half to 14 and a half weeks. So this accelerated but process is a documented process? The accelerated process is the, is the documented consultation um, minutes. The pro Minute. Sorry. Dr. March, I mean, Colin Beatty's explored the process around this, but Audit Scotland quite clearly said that Mr Foley received three months sal uh, salary, three months salary unnecessarily at the expense yes. of taxpayers. Do you agree with that? I agree that that is a valid point. However, what I'm saying is Do you agree that it's correct? I agree it's a valid point, but it's based on the assumption that um, the consultation 
would have actually concluded and Mr Foley would have, um, we would have entered into the contractual VER agreement. I don't think it's based on any process. It's based on the fact that the auditors think that that was an expense to the taxpayer that was unnecessary, £28,000. It was based upon the their way that they explained it moving forward. It was based upon the fact that we announced uh, the the consultation and the announcement, and therefore leading to the announcement of and implementation of the business case of change was the 24th of August. Yeah, I so it's based upon that date being a fixed date. As you start consultation, that is not a fixed date. It was a date, and therefore, if that date had been, ex in my view, had been extended and consultation had gone beyond... Dr Marchant, it's this committee's job to follow the public pound, and yes. Audit Scotland are telling us that 28,000 of those public pounds were spent unnecessarily on... Mr Foley's payments you know so there can be all these processes that have been followed but in the view of the auditors this payment was unnecessary Mr Foley do you agree with that <coughs> well in actual fact convener um, as the process was was developing um, I deliberately didn't uh, engage with the board members in in relation to this as a board because I felt that would be inappropriate so the process that uh, Dr. Martin has outlined is what was followed. Uh, I was then uh, reacting to. We've heard to a an lot offer. about the process. You were paid yeah. twenty-eight thousand pounds. The Audit Scotland have said was unnecessary and has cost the taxpayer. Do you agree that it was unnecessary? I agree that the uh, that I could have perhaps worked a notice period. I would agree with that, and in which case the expense would still have been incurred. Have you paid the but, money back? No, I haven't paid the money Do back. Do you intend to pay the money no, back? No, I don't, because I had a, con a contractual arrangement with my employer under UK employment law. It's all above board. I've done nothing wrong. And do you agree that it, this has been an expense to the taxpayer that could have been avoided? Well, I don't know how it could have been avoided, because I had a notice period, and if I had worked a notice period, I would have been paid for it. I'd like to turn to some of the payments um, that were made to the Deputy Chief Constable. Um, we heard evidence from this at our meeting on the 21st of December. Um, there were relocation payments made to the Deputy Chief Constable. I believe, Mr Foley, you were in charge of these payments being made, is that correct? Yes, that's correct, convener. Okay, and did you feel that the magnitude of these relocation payments were appropriate? Well, they were contractual entitlements, convener, and if I could perhaps explain uh, some of the context in relation to that, and I'll be as brief as possible. Um, the deputy uh, chief constables and senior officers were all given contracts uh, upon the creation of Police Scotland. Uh, within those contracts, there was um, a clause which said they were entitled to uh, relocation payments. The relocation payments at that point uh, pointed to what is commonly referred to as the Strathclyde policy. So a, a legacy policy was adopted and that was put in place. Now, it's also important to note that in uh, police regulations, there is no upper value limit, nor is there a time limit. Uh, in relation to these, but notwithstanding... Well, I understand that there, it, the Strathclyde Police Authority standard operating procedures did put a time limit on it, and that was 18 months. I'm going to go on to that, but what, what I was referring to was the regulations. The policy in Strathclyde was not regulations. Police regulations and policy are different. So but why were you adhering to the Strathclyde operating procedures if there were other regulations in place? Well, if I could come on to that, convener, and if try, you could quickly, and try and yeah, explain it quickly. Uh, so we found ourselves in a situation uh, where uh, there was some... Uh, there were some difficulties as we moved into 2014, in the summer of 2014, uh, where the, we were fast approaching an 18-month uh, period, uh, which was in the Strathclyde policy. And at that point in time, the uh, General Secretary of Scaposa, uh, which is the Scottish Chief Police Officers Staff Association, contacted the then chair of the authority to look for a meeting uh, to see what could be done. The chair instructed me to meet with uh, Mr Barker. Mr Barker and I met on the 6th of August and we made a determination that we would move forward extending uh, the policy 
uh, on a case by case basis until such time as extending a the Strathclyde policy. Yes, until such times as a permanent uh, place of work was determined for the senior officers. Now, so far as I am aware, uh, the first time that that was determined was on the 31st of March 2016. And I recall the conversation clearly with Mr Barker because he used the phrase, which is uncommon nowadays, that the then Chief Constable had been humming and hawing and changing his mind regularly as to where the, the permanent place of work should be. So that's how we got through to the point where the decision for me, uh, when the DCC submitted the claim uh, in relation to the relocation expenses, I had that knowledge. and. Further to that, uh, I then still didn't take the decision to authorise a payment until I had spoken to the chair, and that's what happened. Gosh, OK. Well, I hope I'm not convinced that members of the public will follow all of that sort of convoluted yeah, explanation, but yeah. I'm still not clear whether you were following Strathclyde operating procedures or other I, operating I procedures. Was, I was pointing... Uh, to the Strathclyde uh, procedure at that point in time, but I do. Right. So I do, why? So, so why did you go for the 18 months? Because the permanent place of work hadn't been determined for the. So you're officers. just making it up. No, I met with the general secretary of Scaposa, and that's what we decided to do at that point in time. That's what you decided. So you just decided to put your own rules in place. No, because I was instructed to go the and sort it out by the chair. Sixty-seven thousand pounds in relocation expenses. I don't know anyone in Scotland that expects relocations to that magnitude. Anyone. I have to. I have to say, convener, I understand fully uh, the issue here. And this indeed, is taxpayers' money, Mr. Foley. Yeah, yes. You said you've just decided to disregard mm. or to to overrule no. the Strathclyde procedures. No, she had a con the, the DCC had a contractual entitlement to relocation expenses. It was a contractual entitlement, as far as I'm concerned. OK, so and, she was and I entitled... Do it, yeah, and you I say I she do. was entitled to the 67,000 relocation expenses. How about the 53,000 in her tax liability? The Strathclyde policy had a clause in it which said that the, off the Board of Strathclyde Police had decided that the... That payments to officers for relocation uh, should they should pay the tax. The organisation should pay the tax. There's a clause in there. So you decided is, to stick with the Strathclyde regulations on the tax liability point, but not on the relocation time no, limit. No, no, decided to stick, but not on the time limit because Andrew uh, Barker and I met, uh, as I say, in August 2014. Uh, I was instructed to, that, to go to that meeting by the chair. I informed the chair, and it wasn't Andrew Flanagan. I informed the chair of the outcome of that meeting, and the policy uh, continued thereafter. I accept that it's a lot of money. I absolutely agree with that, but it was a contractual entitlement. What I did before leaving was to say to both to the auditors at the audit clearance meeting and to the audit committee that my recommendation, even though I wouldn't be there to see it implemented, should be that we need to look both within policy and within police regulations, to apply some kind of cap uh, to uh, relocation payments. I think, I think that would be uh, very advisable. But why were the payments coded as childcare vouchers? I was advised by the, uh, the Chief Financial Officer and the Head of Financial Accounting that a member of the finance staff had made a mistake when they coded it. Now, I also recommended to the Audit Committee uh, that we needed to look, moving forward, even though it wouldn't be me, we needed to look at some way uh, of improving the checks and balances in relation to payments to senior officers. And in my view, it's a simple way to do it, because there aren't very many senior officers, is to actually have a report prior to the accounts being uh, submitted to Audit Scotland each year, which simply sets out these are all the payments that have been made to senior officers. Relocation payments are not that common, but I think it would be important to see all payments of any type of expense, and it wouldn't be difficult to do that, and I think that's a, that would be an improvement moving forward as well. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Gavina. Just stay on that point, if you would, Mr Foley, very briefly. You, you've, you've said a number of times these payments that the convener is referring to were contractual, uh, but then you talk about the Strathclyde policy. Uh, could you just give me a bit more detail as to how the Strathclyde policy is ported into uh, an officer's contract, such that it becomes a contractual entitlement, please? Well, the, con the contractual entitlement I refer to stands separate from the Strathclyde policy. So the officer has a contract, which uh, she's given that contract in, uh, when, when she gets a position. And it says in the contract that you will be entitled, if you have to move home, I'm paraphrasing here, if you have to move home, you will be entitled to relocation expenses. So it stops dead on that. Now, my own view is that... So, uh, Let's be very clear. The contractual entitlement was to relocation expenses, but not to 
to the sum set out in the Strathclyde policy. Is that the, correct? No, the, 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 the sum, how that comes about, the, the contract is, it stands alone. So yeah. there's a contract which has a clause which says the officer is entitled to relocation. But it uh, doesn't set out the contractual amount of those it relocation doesn't set out, It doesn't set out the amount. That's what so, I'm asking. So, so somebody made a decision at some point to in, the value in, to use the Strathclyde policy. In February 2000. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so just moving back to something that Colin Beattie was asking you about, uh, but I'd like to ask Dr Marchant. Uh, August 2017, I believe the SPA made a, the final decision about the role of the chief exec by correspondence. Is that correct? The SPA made the decision regarding approval of the costs associated with it. The decision to progress to a redundancy of the role was made at a board meeting on the 7th of June. What proportion of the board made both of those decisions, please? How many acceded to it and how many rejected it? I don't have that uh, um, information today. I, my recollection was I don't remember an objection, but I would have to go back and provide you with that information. I'd be grateful to know if there was any dissent from the board. Mr Hume, perhaps you'd like to comment on this. Was there any dissent from the board, either to the uh, final decision about the chief executive or actually starting off the consultation? Not, not that I recall. No dissent. OK. Uh, Paul Johnson's written submission of the 18th of January said that the Scottish Government officials contacted the SPA uh, on no fewer than three occasions in August 2017, raising concerns about the payment to the outgoing chief executive. Was the full board aware of these concerns? Uh, and were they clear about the Scottish Government's interests in this? The board was clear that the Scottish Government had an interest in it. Um, All of the board? Or I would have updated the board at members' meetings on uh, conversations I'd had. Um, I was made the chair aware. The chair was aware of the concern uh, around the, um, the the package. And did the chair then, perhaps I'll direct this to Mr. Flanagan, did, having been made aware, did you disseminate that? Were you comfortable that the entire board was involved in this and knew what they were talking about? I believe the board was aware of the, both uh, the concerns that had been expressed by government and the basis of the calculations, and they were advised by Dr. Marchant uh, about the, uh, the the way forward. And uh, yeah, I don't think any board member would say that they weren't properly informed. And a final question for me: I, the, I, I have posed this before about a settlement agreement uh, codifying what Mr. Foley received uh, when he exited. I understand that the SPA considered a settlement agreement, but ultimately rejected using a settlement agreement, and yet there is some form of contract in place, we have heard. Why did the SPA reject using a settlement agreement? We had some discussions with uh, Mr Foley, uh, and it was clear that the settlement that he would have been looking for under those circumstances would have exceeded the ERVR arrangements and therefore uh, we decided not to pursue it. Uh, just for the avoidance of doubt, when you say we, does that mean you, Mr Flanagan, or does that mean in consideration with the whole board? I had discussions with him, I had discussions with uh, Dr Marchant and we reported that to the board, yes. Just explain to me if you would, because my understanding of a settlement agreement involves saying to the outgoing employee, here is a large payment in return for which you will sign away your rights to sue us, um, to take us to tribunal, uh, to say nasty things about us, something like that. I'm sure Mr Foley wouldn't do that, of course. Uh, but you explicitly decided not to go down that route, and I'm struggling to understand why, when a rather large payment that Audit Scotland have said may not have been entirely necessary, uh, was being made. Who took that decision and was it in conjunction with the HR department? I believe it was in a discussion with the HR department. Uh, Dr Marchant had a number of conversations with the HR department. Uh, both she, myself and I think the HR department had uh, um, um, discussions with the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government uh, indicated 
that they wouldn't be happy with any settlement they exceeded the amount of the ERVR uh, scheme. But did the Scottish Government say you should be putting them under a settlement agreement? Quite the reverse. They were, uh, and I think uh, Mr Johnson sets out some of this in his letter, uh, that there is a presumption against uh, confidentiality agreements in settlement. Uh, I'm not talking about confidentiality agreements. So Mr Johnson was clear he did not want to see a settlement agreement used in this process. Because it exceeded the, it would exceed the terms of the ERVR scheme. Well, not necessarily. That's a matter for negotiation, isn't it? <coughs> Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener. Um, in terms of uh, another matter, the policing 2026 strategy um, and the development of that whole, whole strategic approach to ICT, there's been some doubt expressed about whether there's sufficient technology delivery capacity within the service to de to deliver this. Uh, first of all, could you comment on whether you agree with that? And could you let us know, please, where we are in relation to the development of the ICT strategy? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll take that for me, Mr Coffey. Um, I, we had a, an audit committee this week on the 22nd of January, and at that committee uh, we received uh, a management report from our internal auditors who uh, prepared a management report on ICT preparedness for uh, Police Scotland. Um, the committee was uh, pleased to receive that report. It's a very well written, a very considered report. And the reason I think that the committee was pleased to receive it was because there have been a, a number of uh, internal audit reviews that have indicated uh, difficulties around uh, aspects of ICT. We all recognise, I think, really across the board, the important role that um, having a, um, a proper ICT vision and strategy has for the delivery of 2026. Um, what we feel, uh, what we felt in the audit committee was that um, we have now seen a very considered, well-articulated statement of the difficulties and issues around ICT that provides an excellent basis for the development of an ICT strategy, probably better than we've had before. Um, and I understand that within Police Scotland, arrangements are now being taken forward uh, to deliver a draft ICT strategy by March 2018. Um, so I think that's my understanding of where we are. But do you, I mean, the question I ask is, do you think there's sufficient capability within the service to deliver it? Because uh, there was some doubt expressed in a formal report about that. Do um, you now think you have the capability to deliver well, this? Well, plainly, um, in the, uh, the management report that we had at the Audit Committee uh, the other day indicates concerns about that. I think that's something we now need to enter into a discussion with Police Scotland well, from an audit committee point of view about the arrangements that they're putting in place first of all to design the strategy and then obviously we'll be looking for assurances about the delivery of that strategy. I mean, when, when given the experience that we had with the I6 project when do you think we'll be in a, a position of comfort do you think to, to persuade members of this committee and the public that the capabilities there to deliver it and schedules and timescales can, can operate in order to deliver it successfully. I think, when will be at that? I think given where we are, um, we've now got this uh, review. Uh, arrangements are in hand, I understand, to deliver a draft strategy by March 2018. Well, that, that will give us the scope of the work involved. Uh, from the other committee perspective, we'll be looking for assurances about implementation and delivery. So I think uh, at some point, not too far distant after March, when we have a chance to reflect on the ICT strategy, as that moves forward for approval, because obviously um, we need that implementation strategy underneath and that will reconcile the resources and the, the challenges that the strategy sets out. OK. Thank, Thank you. you. Bill Bowman. Thank you, convener. If I can maybe um, look at a slightly bigger picture aspect, um, Mr. Hume, I, I think, are you chair of the audit committee? I am, yes. Do you have an auditing qualification? I don't, no. Okay. Um, looking at the, I mean, we started this um, 
I'm looking at the 2016-17 audit report, um, which had a number of recommendations, and we, we've gone on to look at some of the um, items which are in, at the moment, an audit gap period. It'll appear, um, presumably, in the 2017-18 report from Audit Scotland when that comes out sometime later in the year. Uh, you know, we've heard comments about certain transactions, um, were they correct, were they correctly recorded? But what, what has the audit committee done to be satisfied that we will not be having these sorts of comments going forward? Hmm. Um, well, um, in terms of its normal course of business, the audit committee receives evidence-based reports from the internal audit service, um, and uh, these reports identify recommendations for action. Now, over the course of the time that I've been in the chair and the current providers have been providing the internal audit service, uh, there have been 227 recommendations for improvements. Um, the majority of these are either completed or, in, or are in progress. Um, so that <coughs> gives us, if you like, the, uh, a, a pattern of assurance through the audit committee about identify areas, identifying areas of risk around internal controls and so on. When we receive the annual audit plan, um, the audit committee typically takes a meeting to receive it and to hear from the Is this an external plan or an internal audit plan? Sorry, I'm talking about the annual audit plan that is provided by external audit. So that um, is received when we receive the draft accounts. And on this occasion, we received both documents <coughs> on the 22nd of November. Um, these, both these documents go to the board uh, on the, and on this occasion went on the 28th of November. Um, the audit committee uh, receives the audit plan again at its next meeting <coughs> and uh, that along with the section 22 report we consider that our meeting as we have done in previous years uh, this week on the 22nd of January. Uh, we have indicated that we accept uh, the terms of both reports. We have um, a, taken a, an instruction that management are now required to develop an implementation plan around uh, all the recommendations and the actions that are set out in the annual audit report. That is being uh, included into a tracker and regular reports will come back to the audit committee on the implementation uh, and delivery of the actions set out in the annual audit report. You have an additional question, Mr. Uh, if I may, yes, please. Um, can, can you tell me how you structure the um, internal audit? Because it seems to me, from if I understand it, you can have an internal auditor in the organisation with their own staff. You could have an internal auditor um, with an outside body doing the work or you can totally externalise it and have somebody else doing the work. Are you the third case? We are. The, the internal audit service for Police Scotland and the SPA is provided by uh, a tendered um, private company. Do you think that gives you the, I mean, given the issues that have come up, close enough control over what's actually going on in the organisation? I think it does. You asked uh, in your first question if I'd had a, if I have an auditing qualification, I don't. But I have uh, served on aud audit committees and worked on audit committees as a professional and worked with uh, internal audit services which have been in-house uh, over decades. I, I need to be careful what I say here because we're about to enter into a, a new a tendering arrangement for a, a new contract. But I have to say that having experienced working in this way, I am content with that and I believe uh, we have a <coughs> derived a, a good service from that arrangement. And that's without comment on the, uh, the company providing the service. I'm not questioning them, just my yeah. final remark. My, my feeling is that if you don't have one person who is an internal auditor with their sort of feet under the desk and knowing what's going on, walking the corridors, somebody coming in just doing that job with a program may not give you the right, the right answer. I think uh, I wouldn't challenge your view. It's an interesting perspective. My perspective is 
that the head audit partner um, is uh, very well acquainted with the issues. Um, you, you may know yourself that as they put together the, annual, the internal audit annual plan for the coming year, they engage in a wide range of consultation with management, staff, with stakeholders, and with a, through the work <coughs> we do on risk. And a confident of their abilities, Mr. Hume. I am. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I ask? Um, I'm going to take you back briefly to the Deputy Chief Constable's um, relocation payments. Nicola Marchant and David Hume, would you ex have expected these decisions to come past the board? The, the decisions regarding the amounts, um, if they are within the delegated authority to the CEO, then no. Um, I would not have expected approval of the amounts. Okay. Because Audit Scotland has said that they would have expected additional governance arrangements to support the decision that Mr Foley made on these relocation expenses. you think that's wrong? No, I said the the payment of that, if they are within the delegated authority to the, the CEO. Mm -hmm. I think um, the, the challenges regarding the, the 18 months and that decision, but um, as Mr Foley has reported, that was a discussion that he had with the then chair. It I was not a member of the board at that time. I do not know whether the then chair had any conversations with the board. Okay, so he, Audit Scotland have reported that he did not advise members of the Scottish Police Authority of these payments at any board meeting or committee meeting. So you're content with that? No, that isn't what I said. I said that Sorry. actually um, I would expect if, um, we were, if an individual was going to want to work outside of a, a policy or an SOP, then there would be some governance around how the approval for working outside of that was in place. Okay, but your your take on this was that he wasn't working outside, he was working within his delegated authority, so there was no need to bring it to the board. What I said was I believe he was working within his delegated authority regarding yes. the amounts that right. were signed off. I, have, I was not on the board at that time. I was not involved in whether or not any discussions were had between the then chair and the board regarding the, the, um, the paint the circumstances in which the payment was made. So you think it's fine that the, all of this didn't come to the board? No, I said I, I would... As sorry, a, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm struggling as a to get the, the uh, difference. My, as part of a continual improvement and strengthen of governance, I would... Um, my preference would be that when there were exceptions to policy that there was a governance route in place, and depending upon where, where those exceptions were in in uh, the organisation, I would expect a grandparenting process. Would you prefer that these decisions did come to the board? If they were decisions that were associated with senior people within the organisation... Um, Given the, the scale board... of these payments, would you prefer that this had come to the board? Or would, I... are you happy that it didn't? The board delegates authority to the chief executive with regards to approvals. If they are, were, if Dr. there are policies, Dr. Marshall, being... please forgive me, but this is taxpayers' money, and I really think this is semantics. You know, the Scottish Police Authority has a responsibility with what we do with taxpayers' money, and we find that the deputy chief constable has been paid over one hundred thousand pounds in relocation expenses and tax liability. And you're telling me that you are content it didn't come to the board? No, I'm saying if that it was um, a, if the delegation of authority meant that the chief executive officer was authorised to approve payments of that value, then that is a decision that the board has made to delegate to the chief executive officer. However, I would expect, as an improvement in our governance process, that if those payments were subject because they were having a potential going outside of a policy or a process, then I would expect an exception to policy and process to either go to an audit committee or to the board. Do you know if the new interim chief officer's contract has been fully reviewed to ensure that it doesn't allow him to take actions that would be more appropriately taken by the board? That would not be in his contract. That would be within the governance 
um, documents of the board. I'll confirm that with my yeah. colleague here. Uh, when I referred earlier to recommendations that I made before leaving, that was part of the recommendation that okay. in future, that uh, this was an unusual circumstance and I accept that, but in future, mm. then my recommendation to the audit committee was that all such payments should be should go before a committee in much the same way that Dr. Marston has just said, whether it's people, whether it's audit, you know, that's for the members to determine. I've gone now, so th sure. that was a recommendation. Thanks, Mr Foley, that is helpful. Can I ask, has the Scottish Police Authority considered reclaiming any of these relocation expenses? Dr Marchant. Not that I'm aware of, but I have not had any discussion regarding these expenses. Okay. Can I ask um, all of you, if um, were any of you contacted by Scottish Government officials before today's meeting regarding the evidence that you were to give today? No. 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 Not at all? No. no. Okay. Can I thank you all very much indeed for your attendance and your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of the committee meeting. <laughs>